okay all right everybody uh, good uh, good evening and welcome to uh, lecture 10 of eh870 so what we are looking at right now is a photo of uh, one of uh, the most powerful quantum computers in the world right now which is goes by the name of uh, Zhu Zhang and the other one is called uh, Zhu Chong Z both of these devices are uh, have been built in china and this is a this is an optical uh, device and since it uses photons which are not susceptible to decoherence uh, at room temperature this device actually does work at room temperature so the reason i am showing this is because one of the uh, participants uh, said that quantum computers are like you require superconductivity so this is just to remind you first of all that Superconducting qubits are just one form of one impl one way to implement uh, qubits. At its core, quantum computing or any other form of computing is not about the medium. The medium can be anything, right? The same way uh, that you can write uh, on sand, uh, you you can take a stick and you can make messages on sand or uh, you can write on paper, right? Or you can take pebbles on little stones and put your message in that form. Or, so the point is, all different ways of conveying information can be used to convey the same information, right? In the same way, different physical system can be used uh, as qubits. So uh, what you need is a, is a quantum system and uh, uh, several copies of that quantum system and the ability to make those systems interact with one another and uh, to be able to measure the state of that, uh, of those systems. So you can do that with superconducting qubits. You can also do it with, uh, with, with photons, right? So this uh, device, uh, uses photons as the qubits. And one of the questions is that in what sense precisely is quantum computer, is a quantum computer uh, faster than a, than a classical computer? So one of, the, one of the ways which hasn't yet been realized and was just, uh, I was just reminded of by Rohan Malia, one of the participants, is uh, that uh, quantum computers hold out the hope of being able to solve uh, NP hard problems uh, in, 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 in polynomial time. Uh, so for instance, uh, you know, a, a quantum computer could ideally, if it, you know, if it had that, if it was uh, um, sophisticated enough, uh, could uh, break the encryption scheme known as RSA, which is the basis of all modern communication, uh, by because you can use a use your quantum computer to factor uh, a number, and you can do so. There is an algorithm which is known as Shor's, which is named after Peter Shor, Shor's factoring algorithm, uh, which allows you to find the prime factors of any number. In uh, a time, I believe that that, that goes as uh, uh, non uh, as a polynomial in in n, that n is the size of the number. So that is one application. But at present, the quantum advantage, right? So this is the term that is. Uh, this is the term that is heard most often these days in the media uh, or quantum primacy or quantum supremacy and so on and so forth. So for instance, in 2019, uh, this was supposed to be the first time that a quantum computer uh, showed, was shown to be able to solve, uh, to perform a calculation uh, 
which were at a rate which was demonstrably faster than any classical device, right? So, for instance, uh, this was some a 53 qubit Sycamore processor, which is a superconduct squid device, carried out a calculation in 200 seconds. Uh, that uh, allegedly would take a classical supercomputer 10,000 years. Okay. Uh, of course, you know, there have been uh, debates and controversies about this claim, right? So there's, there's a session that with better classical algorithms, you could shorten that down to 2.5 days, but 2.5 days is still uh, much, much longer uh, time than 200 seconds. Right? It's still orders of magnitude more than 200. Uh, so the question is that 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 what sort of a of, of a task are these are these present day quantum computers implementing right they're, they're certainly not factoring uh, large numbers okay or doing anything which is um, so, you know very practically useful right so what they're doing is uh, something known as Gaussian boson sampling. <laughs> and at, at its core, what it is basically is that this is, this is a problem uh, which involves statistical uh, estimation. Uh, so you, you, you know, the, the goal is that you have some target probability distribution, classical probability distribution, and uh, you, your device has to uh, search through the space of all probability distributions until it finds uh, the one, uh, you know, the the, the target. Uh, so this is this is not not exactly something that is easily translatable into something practically useful, uh, but it is something which uh, can be uh, harnessed. For example, in algorithms uh, uh, where you want to study the bonding between uh, different types of molecules and uh, and and reaction processes, which which are at at heart quantum mechanical processes, right? So, anyways, uh, so so there is clear evidence and uh, un un. Uh, At this stage, uh, unquestionable evidence that we have devices which can uh, solve problems in a time faster than any comparable, than any classical machine would be able to do. Once again, let me just check. Uh, is my screen visible? Is my audio clear? Uh, can somebody please confirm once for me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, good. So we are a go. All right, so lecture nine, which was the last lecture I talked about, well, we talked a lot about C0. Uh, so uh, I introduced the swap circuit, uh, which uh, is constructed by taking combinations of C0 gates. And uh, one of the uh, important aspects of this uh, construction is uh, is the fact that the C naught gate in 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 one part of the circuit uh, is uh, reversed, uh, so the target and control qubits are switched. So uh, and then I explained uh, the how you would write down the expression for um, the matrix which represents this quantum gate. And I showed, for instance, that if you have some state, uh, how uh, these, this operator acts on a state, right? So in order to, and to give you a new state, right? And then, of course, there is there are some notation notational pitfalls that you all have to be careful about. Uh, 
for example, I tensor J is not the same as the outer product of I and J. Okay, so are there any questions about any of this? Have you all been able to follow this? Uh, I suppose there would, there might still be questions about cloning and copying, but I think we'll put those aside for the time being. But if you have any questions about uh, the implementation of the swap gate or uh, the more technical details about um, matrix elements of operators and so on, then please ask, okay? All right, so today uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to introduce another algorithm. Uh, well, this will be the first algorithm. So it's not another, it's the first algorithm, I suppose. I mean, you can also call this an algorithm, right? This, uh, this swap gate that we have talked about, This, this is, you can also say, well, well this, this corresponds to an algorithm, um, which tells us how we can exchange uh, the two quantum states, right? Of course, if you think about this in classical terms, Objects. That's it. That's your algorithm. Do something is somewhat more, uh, somewhat less trivial. And so the what we will look at today is what is known as quantum teleportation. Now, uh, I presume that many of you, or all of you, perhaps. One second. Let me just not this thing yet. Have uh, seen some sci-fi sci movies or right, something. Yeah, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Star Trek, uh, right? So what happens there is that uh, you, have, you have a person, they go and stand on, on some stage and some, somebody presses a button and something, you know, some special effects happen. And then there is another, uh, such you can call it teleportation booth at another location and this person uh, evaporates right disassembles at this point and reassembles at this point okay. and so that that's pretty amazing uh, this is uh, sci-fi teleportation so that is not what we are, that is not the kind of teleportation that uh, we will be talking about. Uh, though the teleportation that we, this quantum teleportation can in principle be used to construct such a device. Okay. Uh, but it's hard enough to make it work for a single qubit um uh, the idea that you could use it to transfer the state of something complex like a molecule or a living cell or a human being is very 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 far from the realm of possibility at present all right so for the purpose of the discussion uh, we have to introduce what are known as as bell states so we have talked about uh, these states previously. These states are uh, entangled states, okay? And how do you, uh, so let, let me write down a, an expression. These are two qubit states. And so I'm using the notation of Nielsen and Chuang. So, Uh, this state is is a superposition of zero zero and one one 
then this is a superposition of 0, 1, and 1, 0. The root 2 is just a normalization factor. Then there is B1, uh, 0, which is the same state as B0, 0, but uh, with a but where one of the states has a negative phase uh, relative to uh, the rest to the to the other component and the same thing for b11 where again you, you get a relative phase factor of minus 1 so these are the four bell states and they are also known as oops Sorry about that. They are also known as EPR EPR pairs. Okay. So just a small historical side note about what or who EPR is all about. So EPR stands for Einstein. Podolsky and Rosen. So what happened is that uh, Einstein played um, a central role in the development of quantum theory, right? Because in 1905, he described the, explained the photoelectric effect uh, And for this purpose, he invoked uh, the existence of quanta of light, right? Where the energy of a single quantum is proportional to the frequency of a light. So, so he, he gave the first uh, practical use, well, the, the second practical use, the first one was Planck, of, of uh, this quantum concept. And then later on, you know, there were a lot of other developments. Uh, well, in 1912, uh, there was Bohr who came up with his uh, model. Of atoms, right? Where atom where the electrons are live in in orbitals, uh, then, then there was Sommerfeld soon after, uh, I presume probably 1913 or so, who along with Bohr, he is associated with the idea of Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization. And this is, I think the first time that the notion of quantization, that is how do you take a classical theory and get a quantum theory out of it first came out. Uh, then I, the next important development I believe was, I think around 1922, when De Broglie said that, well, uh, even uh, massive particles have a wavelength, uh, which, is, which is inversely proportional to their momentum, Right, so this is the birth of the wave particle duality. And uh, then of course, there are a lot of experiments uh, going on during this process. There's a Compton effect, there's a stern garlock experiment. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of those. Uh, I want to come to einstein podolsky rosen So I'm just providing you some historical background for what einstein podolsky rosen is all about. Uh, some of you may not be interested in this historical background, or you may find it completely irrelevant. But uh, I am a firm believer uh, that uh, understanding the historical development of a field is the best way to uh, be able to predict its future development. And since that is what we all uh, aim to do, I think this is it's important, at least for anybody who's interested uh, in in in, uh, in 
expanding the frontiers of research. So the Compton, Stern, Gerlach, and others, and then Heisenberg, Schrodinger, right? They developed a wave matrix and wave mechanics. Okay, and incidentally, what we are doing in this entire course is matrix mechanics. Okay. This is quantum computation. Wave mechanics in applies to quantum systems which have uh, to continuous quantum systems, for instance, a particle on a line, which have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So we don't we don't use those for, for quantum computation. We use systems with a finite number of degrees of freedom. Right? And then and then so all of this then the whole formalism of quantum mechanics was developed. Now, the thing is that Einstein at this point, like around 1927 or so, he became very dissatisfied with, uh, this, with, with this developing uh, paradigm, right? And, 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 and uh, he said these uh, famous words, right? That God does not, play dice with the universe, right? Of course, he said this in German, in which it, it sounds very much more elegant and authoritative. Uh, what he meant was, right, that quant he, he was comparing quantum mechanics to, to playing dice. The playing dice is what you do, right? Like if you play a game like Ludo or Monopoly, you have a pair of die. And you throw those two those, those dice. They have numbers, and whatever number shows up, you that determines what your next move will be, right? And so uh, he, you know, was of the opinion that well, what quantum mechanics is doing, or at least this, this theory is saying, is that there is no underlying reality. Everything is probabilistic, right? And so he had a philosophical opposition to this idea, right? So because he was thinking about this, he, along with his collaborators, he was, he had some postdocs and some other researchers, two of them, one was Podolsky and one was Rosen. And he came up with a thought experiment, right? And Einstein is famous for, uh, the uh, invention or at least the popularization of uh, what, what is known as a thought, rate, thought experiment, right? And let's see which year was this, 1935 if I'm not mistaken, but I could be wrong, I'm just checking once. Yes, 1935. So they wrote a paper, right? which is one of, of the most important papers in uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics. Mm. So in 1935, EPR wrote this paper, which, which is the title of the paper is, can description of reality be considered oops, be considered complete right so the argument was uh, what what the title of the paper is that well mechanical description of reality cannot be considered to be a complete description of reality there is something missing that we don't know about right and so it is uh, for this purpose that they came up with the notion of this uh, bell pair uh, or bells which are now known as bell states 
or EPR, EPR states. Okay, so this is just a, and now we will see in the discussion uh, what makes this, what makes these states uh, so special. Okay, so this is this is just a very well again brief historical digression. So you have these states, right? And 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 these are states of two qubits. Okay, so for instance, if you look at it, and they're all entangled, right? Each one of these states is an entangled state because you cannot write as a product of a state in one Hilbert space and a product of a state in the second Hilbert space. So, uh, so for instance, if you look at, at uh, one of these states, you lo look at beta zero one, so how is this how is a state like this uh, created uh, you let's say you have some some particle uh, which which is, which is uh, which has spin zero Okay, so it doesn't have angular momentum, all right? And uh, so there is a lag between my, uh, is that correct? Between my voice and the updates, my writing? There's some time with this, some time with this. Okay, so, I, uh, all right, well, uh, so you start with, uh, with some spin zero particle, right? And it decays, uh, into two spin one half particles. Okay, so the so it so this has uh, spin one half right in units of h bar, and this has spin one half in units of h bar. But since this state, the angular momentum was zero, the final state also has to have zero angular momentum. So if you say that the angular momentum of the first particle is L1 and the second particle is L2, then the two particles, the angular momentum has to be zero, right? And uh, since uh, we're talking about uh, the quantum mechanical degree of freedom, right? Uh, this is going to correspond to the LZ component in terms of the angular momentum operators. For those of you who don't remember all of this, don't worry too much about it. So this has to be zero, right? So you can associate the up state, right? Uh, you, you can say that the first particle is either in the up state or the down state. And the second particle is likewise in either in the up state or the down state, right? So how many different possibilities are there? Well, there are two possibilities, right? Uh, the first possibility is that the first particle is in the up state and the second particle is in the down state, right? And then the, other option is this, right? So these are the two states. And we also write these states as zero one and one zero, right? So the up state is what we call the zero state and the down state is what we call the one state. So if these were classical particles, then this would be it. The state of the system would be, uh, described by by this configuration or this configuration, right? But because it's a quantum mechanical system, the state of both of these particles after the decay is going to be described by some superposition of these two possibilities, okay? And since this, We'll, we, we'll take this to be a, a mechanism which is symmetric in some sense. We can set alpha is equal to, or at least 
the modulus of alpha is equal to beta, right? And so that gives us, for instance, the plus minus state, okay? Now, these two particles, they, are, they, they still have an existence as, as independent particles, okay? So what, what one can do is, you have a lab, right? In this lab, there is, there is your uh, apparatus setup, which starts with this neutral uh, spin zero state, uh, DK that undergoes DK. And then, so I'll try to use a different color for the second particle. Right, so these are the two particles. One is a red one and black one, and then the red particle is sent off to another part of the world. Okay, so it's sent off to Boston, and the black particle is sent off to where is it sent off to? Concord. Right, because when I think of Boston. Concord is the thing that is closest in, in mind. <laughs> That's a silly joke. Uh, so now you might say, well, how can you send, what does it mean to send off these particles? You send them off without measuring the state of the particle. Okay, and it can be done. For instance, these could be two photons and you send them down optical fibers and you don't measure the state at any point. Okay. So now the person in, in, in Concord has this one particle and the person in Boston has the other particle, right? And now the person in Concord makes a measurement. Okay. And the result of this measurement is that the first particle turns out to be in the upstate, right? Now Boston, is very far from Concord, right? But if you look at this quantum state, right? What this quantum state tells you is the following, that if the first particle is in the up state or the zero state, right? Then the second particle has to be in the so so this is a the first particle but this implies that the second particle will be in the down state even in the absence of any measurement okay and this is the most important thing the person in boston has not measured the state of their particle yet right but the Kanpur person knows for certain that when the Boston person measures their particle, they will find it to be in a down state. Okay, similarly, you can, you know, say the same thing for Boston, if you can switch sides. And now the thing is that you can perform these measurements so fast that the inter, that there is no time for any classical communication between the Kanpur and Boston uh, just just uh, please uh, give me one second one can't one can't control the quantum states of a particle and one can't control the classical states of a toddler uh, so I apologize for any screaming and shouting that you might hear in the background so you can con you can conduct these these measurements so fast that there is no time for classical signal to travel from point A to point B, right? So the person in Concord has no way of communicating to the person in Boston that they found the particle to be in the upstate, right? So so this is this is this is entanglement, right? And and likewise if 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 the particle is found to be in the down state then that tells you that the Boston particle will be in the upstate. 
okay and maybe since we are using these these names we might as well label the states accordingly so this is so this is a bell pair okay uh, and that is what we will be using to perform uh, our our teleportation and then uh, let me introduce uh, another notation which will become important later on uh, which is as follows that you can write uh, these these states right so what are the values 0 1 1 0 0 0 and 1 1 so you can write them as x and y so you can say beta x y okay and then what is the state of the particle it is as follows it is 0 comma y and then plus let me write it down and then i'll explain what each of these expressions means okay so x and y are uh, what are the possible values of x and y they take values in 0 and 1 okay now uh, so 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 what is going on uh, with this if you look at this this table here right what is minus 1 to the to 0 it's 1 and minus 1 to 1 is uh, minus 1 okay and then not y this is equal to the negation of y so not 0 is 1 and not 1 is 0 all right so if you say that y is equal to 0 uh, and x is equal to 0 and you substitute these two values in the above expression what do you get you get 0 0 plus minus 1 to the power 0 which gives you 1 times 1 comma not y not y is 1 root 2 right so this gives you the 0 0 1 1 state and this is what according to our terminology that we had given earlier this is the uh, the state that we are talking about okay so x is 0 y is 0 and so this is beta 0 0 and then i will leave it as an exercise for you to convince yourself that beta x y um, this notation works for the remaining three combinations which are 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 okay all right now let's look at a circuit which can be used to generate these bell pairs okay so the circuit is as follows you have two qubits and okay yes this so you send in your two qubits here you have a single qubit gate which acts on the first qubit which is h h is the hardamard gate after that there is a control not operation and the output of this the combined state that comes out of it is beta xy all right so let, let's let's uh, see what that how how that happens okay so what is the hardamard gate hardamard is this is is given by this matrix right and what does hardamard do if you act on one on the zero state it gives you 0 plus 1 by root 2 and if you act on the one state it gives you 0 minus 1 by root 2 all right this is what the hardamard gate gives you so at this point 
just before the C naught, the state that goes into the control qubit is H acting on X. Okay, so the output is going to be the C naught of H acting on X uh, and the target is Y. So the second part of the circuit consists of, you can write the input as HX, which is zero plus minus one by root two, and then Y. And then you have this C naught gate. And what is the C naught gate? Let's remind ourselves. The C naught gate uh, gives us zero X or Y. So we can write this as zero X or Y, right? The, the result will be plus minus one X, one X or Y. I'm, I'm sorry, there's, there's too much disturbance in the background. Uh, okay. Again, I will leave it as an exercise for you to show that this circuit generates beta x y. Uh, well, I'll 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 demonstrate it for one for one of the sets. Let's put x is equal to zero and y is equal to zero. So we get zero, zero. The Hardamard gate acts on zero and it gives us zero plus one by root two. And then we have a C naught operation. Okay, so what is the what is the C naught matrix? Let us remind ourselves one one zero one. Okay, and what is the state that goes into the C naught gate? The state that goes into the C naught gate is zero plus minus one by root two. This is the first qubit tensor with zero. Okay. What is this state? This is zero, zero, plus minus one, zero by root two. How can I write this in terms of vectors? I can write it as one, and then zero, and then one, and zero. Uh, and then here I can put a plus minus in this coefficient by root two. And so what is the output going to be here? the output, so let me call this psi in, is going to be the C naught gate acting on psi in. So if I look at the effect of the C naught gate on the coefficients, what does it do? It exchanges the last two components, right? So I get this state. And if I write, write out this state in terms of uh, the basis vectors, it is zero, zero plus minus one, one, by root two. So why is right? there a plus minus? It should be- Yeah, I, I, I probably didn't need to include a plus, but if you if you just say for uh, this thing, uh, yeah, so I, I probably should get rid of the minus every. The minus is if I send in uh, if I send in a one state instead of okay. so so what is going on for x is equal to zero y is equal to zero what is the circuit doing the circuit is giving me the state beta zero zero okay 
and so the exercise is for you to show that the circuit generates beta x y for the other values of x y okay all right so so this is the this is the circuit which is creating our bell pair all right and it is a very general circuit in the sense that if i send in the whichever zero or one any combination of zero one i'll get the corresponding uh, the output as beta xy okay so now i'm going to come to quantum teleportation before that let me quickly ask uh, uh, you all, uh, does anybody have to accept it at 6 pm for a class yes no no i take that as a no okay so i am going to continue and take another 20 minutes or so okay so before going to teleportation i have a question like uh, yes yes just a clarification uh, in the while, while defining bell pairs we did that alpha modulus of alpha is equal to modulus of beta right yes are we yes. just taking that for arbitrarily just for making it easy or it need not like be alpha modulus of alpha equal to beta right yeah here only It's yeah. Necessarily, alpha need not be equal to beta, right? The modulus. Well, no. I mean, in in if if you think about this kind of a decay process, where uh, now some state is decaying into two identical states, right? Hmm. So, for instance, you have a photon that that decays into an electron positron pair. So the photon has. Uh, is in is in a spin zero state right and the two electron the electron is in this electron and positron are in the spin one half states right. so in this case uh right i mean there is no there is no reason why uh the decay uh would be would be would be asymmetric right in fact it would not be what because it is not it would not be possible because if that was the case uh then what it would say is you could use such a process to create an excess of one kind of particle over another right so because if mo one modulus of one state was greater than the other that means the probability of the existence of that state is greater than the so you could use it to create uh and you you start out with a with a neutral state and then you have this process which is which you can repeat many times to give you an excess of one kind of particle over another so you you would you would be uh producing uh charge violation conservation of charge violation right and so unless 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 so if this process is is a process that conserves charge then alpha will always be equal to beta okay so yes sir. thank you unless there is some fundamental underlying asymmetry uh, which favors one one kind of charge particle over another that will not be the case you can make the same argument uh, for a single a photon in a in a spin zero state decaying into two photons uh one with angular momentum plus h bar and one with angular momentum minus h bar okay all right so now let's go to go to teleportation and let let us set up uh the let us describe the the setup okay so you have these two people okay one is alice and one is bob all right and 
so what happens is uh, that there is this machine which generates epr pairs okay and it gives one of the one of the pairs to alice okay so let let's say that state is in xa and the other state it, the other uh, half of the epr pair goes to bob and we'll say that is in the state yb okay so we don't know right now okay what is x or what is y or or actually better than x and y because you might be tempted to think that we'll call this uh, phi and psi so these are two two states all we know is that they are produced as a result of this epr process okay and now what happens is uh, that alice goes off somewhere circumstances separate them sadly right they go go off to some far away place alice goes off to kanpur she is like wants to explore indian culture and bob goes off to boston because uh he really likes uh baseball and that one team the boston celtics i think he's a he's a celtics fan but then one day alice finds herself in trouble because there is some auto driver in kanpur who is charging her too much and so she wants to send a message to bob okay so what she wants to do is she wants to send the state of her qubit her the state of her qubit is psi a she wants to to send this state to bob okay and but the problem is the problem is the following alice and bob have not made any measurements of these two epr pairs right because if they make a measurement the moment anybody measures the state it destroys the entanglement it's no longer an epr pair so the state psi of a right is not known to alice and alice can only send classical information to bob so alice doesn't have any means of sending uh, the quantum state as such but is there some way that she can uh, uh, describe that she can you know send this state now uh, so the thing is that even if she knew what the state psi was right even if she knew the state uh well okay no i don't like this argument so i'm not going to mention it. so how so what what is the what is the algorithm for this for this teleportation process it's as follows um uh oh 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 oh, oh, oh. my mistake let me let me let me, let me just just uh, correct myself so alice has some has some message and that message she encodes in this state and that's not the epr pair my apologies that ep it, it's some state chi so she wants to send this state chi to bob so what does alice do alice takes the unknown state psi and she interacts it with her copy of the epr pair okay and now she has two qubits and then she performs a measurement of the state of these two qubits so what are, what are the possible results of this measurement the possible results are 0 0 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 right and these these are all classical bits and also it's important to point out 
that when she makes a measurement of this two qubit system that uh, that does not cause the entanglement between the two EPR pairs to disappear. Okay. We'll see how that works. So then she gets one of these results, let's say zero one, and she sends it to Bob. Okay, one WhatsApp. She sends a WhatsApp message to Bob. Bob gets this number zero one. And what does he have in his possession? He has this number zero one, this data zero one, and the other half of the EPR pair, right? So this is the half of the EPR pair, right? And this is the quantum state that Alice wishes to, uh, to transmit to Bob, right? And this is the second half of the EPR pair, which has, has always been in the possession of Bob. Okay, and so what this algorithm says is that Bob, not Bob, Bob can take the result, the zero one and phi beta, and from this, he can recover the state chi. And he can recover the state chi precisely, exactly, okay? And so first, uh, so how, how does this work? Okay. So let's start with the, with the state that has to be teleported. Let's say chi. So chi will be some superposition of zero and one. Okay. Because again, we're taking it to be a qubit. Okay. And um, we started off with a bell pair, right? Uh, so we started off with this beta zero zero. Okay. And so we created a beta zero zero pair and we gave one copy to Bob and one copy to Alice. So what is the, what, what does, what happens when Alice interacts? When Alice interacts, Chi with her state psi a, she is also effectively generating an interaction between chi and the second half of the EPR pair, which is phi b, why? Because psi a and phi b are entangled, right? So even though Alice and Bob are very far away from each other, when Alice takes this qubit, this qubit described by this sky or chi, and interacts it with her copy of the bell pair, her, her half of the bell pair, she generates an interaction with the other half. So the circuit for this system involves three qubits to begin with. Even though Alice and Bob are very far away, okay, from each other. So this is the unknown state and these two uh, wires, they represent the bell pair. Okay, and let's say this is Alice, Alice's copy, Alice's half and this is Bob's half. All right. Now, how does she, what, what is the next step? Next step is as follows. Alice takes this unknown qubit 
and her half of the bell pair. And she sends both of them through a C naught gate. Okay, and now see, this is important to remember that Alice doesn't know the state of this, of this particle chi or the state of her half of the EPR pen. Okay, she has not made any measurements on these two systems, but she can still feed them into this C naught gate. This is the important part to keep in mind. Okay, so there is no measurement that ha is happening at this stage. After that, she takes the, sec the unknown state and sends it through a hard amount gate. And after that, she takes a measurement, she measures the state of both of these qubits, right? And so when, they, when she measures the state of these qubits, they will come out to be either zero or one, right? So it'll be zero, one or zero, zero, one, zero or zero, zero, fine. So what, what does she get? She gets a classical bit coming out of these two measurements. So let me, let us call this M1 and M2. Okay. And meanwhile, Bob is down here, right? And Bob is waiting, waiting, waiting. Bob has his half of the EPR pair. So Alice gets these two numbers, M1 and M2, and sends them to Bob. As soon as Bob gets these numbers, what does he do? He takes his half of the EPR pair and sends it through the following gate. X raised to the power M2. And I'll tell you in a second what that means. And he... He takes the unknown state and sends it through a gate, which is Z to the power M1. And the claim is that at the end of this process, Bob's qubit will end up in this unknown state chi, which is what Alice had in her possession at the beginning. Okay, so why, is, why does any of this work? The reason it works is as follows. Alice and Bob share a pair of particles which are in an entangled state. So when Alice performs this C0 operation on the particle carrying the unknown state and her half of the EPR, EPR pair, She's changing the state of the whole system. She's not just changing the state of these two qubits. She's also changing the state, the global state of the system. Because these two qubits are entangled. Okay, so entanglement means that if you fiddle around with one piece, you change everything. Okay you change all the other pieces also. Now, uh, let's write down the state of the system uh, at, at, different, at different stages. All right, so we will say that, this, that the global state of the system, uh, we will represent that uh, with, for lack of, symbols and a lack of creativity will represent the global state with uh, psi. psi. And so we'll say that the state that goes into the circuit is psi naught. After the C naught gate is applied, the state becomes psi one. After the Hardamard gate is applied, the state becomes psi two. After the measurements are made, the state becomes psi three. 
And finally, after these two gates are applied, the state becomes psi four. And what we want to show is that psi four is going to be equal to chi. So what is the input state of our circuit? The input state is the product state chi and beta zero zero. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, the Hadamard gate we are applying only to the psi uh, mm -hmm. state. So why only to the chi chi state chi chi state. Yeah. chi state? So why there mm -hmm. is a change like uh, the qubits with Alice and Bob they are entangled now. So why does a change making a change in chi state changes psi one to psi two? Well, because remember what does the C not gate do? The C not gate is an entangling gate, no? Okay, so like, so the C naught gate will entangle Chi and Alice's EPR pair, EPR half. Got it, got it, got it. So the, for example, that Alice, right? So, they, so all let's, of let's, three are, yes, all three are let's, entangled let's, now. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. All right. And so what is the this initial state of the system? We'll write it as follows. Uh, remember that, that chi is some superposition of zero and one. Uh, so this state can be written as one by root two, alpha zero plus beta one. This is the unknown state. Tensor beta zero zero. Uh, and that's where the one by root two comes from. And so beta zero zero is zero zero plus one one. Okay. And if you multiply all of these out, what do you get? You get the following, you get alpha zero 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 plus alpha zero one one plus beta one zero zero plus beta one one one. Okay. Now, what uh, uh, are the different qubits? So let me point that out. This is the unknown state, right? The first qubit is the unknown state. And we make that red. The second qubit, uh, This is Alice's uh, half, okay? So Alice's EPR pair or Alice's EPR. So we'll make this green. And then the third qubit in this notation is Bob's EPR. Okay, so this is oops. sorry. Yeah. All right, so please make sure that you you know are are, are able to follow this, okay? This is true for all of the remaining vectors also, right? So this is the unknown qubit. The second one is Alice's half and the third one is Bob's half, okay? So this is our convention. So what is this state? This is the input state. Now, Alice sends her two qubits, right? The red one and the green one, uh, through a C naught gate. Okay. Now, what happens when Alice sends her two states uh, through the C naught gate, right? So, well, let, let us let us examine what will happen to these states, right? What will happen to zero zero when we send it through a C naught gate? You will get zero zero, right? 
zero one will give you zero one. One zero will give you one one. And one one will give you one zero. Right? Because the first qubit is the control qubit and the second one is the target qubit. So the unknown state is what we are using as the control in the C0, right? So what does this tell us? The 0, 0, 0 component will be unchanged. The 0, 0, 1 component, there is no 0, 0, 1 component, so this doesn't matter, right? So sorry, it, this is the, my mistake, one second, let me, what are the other other three components? The other three components are zero, one, one, right? So this is zero, one, one. This will be unchanged. Then you have one, zero, zero. This will become one, one, one. And then you have one, one, one. This will become one, zero, one. Okay, and let me let me just uh, number these for you. Excuse me, sir. Ha, one sir, second. The third one. one. One second, one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I I spotted it. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, let me call this A B uh, C and D, and so this is A. This is B, this is C and D. And as Shantanu quickly spotted, I made a mistake here. Bob's qubit is not affected by this operation. Okay? So so in all of these cases, Bob's qubit is unchanged. Is this fine? Any, any questions at this stage? So I thought both Alice and Bob's qubit will invert because they are in no. Right? no, the whole global state is changed, right? So what is the state? Let's let's write down the state now. Let's write down what is psi one after the C naught gate, right? After the C naught gate, what happens to psi one? It becomes alpha zero 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 plus alpha zero one one plus beta. 1, 1, 0 plus beta 1, 1, 1. And now this state is not the same as psi naught, right? The global state of the system has changed. Do you follow me? The result of the C naught operation, the C naught operation does not change Bob's qubit, but it changes the global state of the system. Do you see that or not? Yeah, I do. Okay. That's, that's what I'm saying now. So the global state has, has been modified, even though the interaction has only happened between two subsystems. Sir, uh, yes. so once the measurement, uh, once a C0 gate is applied, the entanglement yes. between Bob and Alice is broken, right? No, not at all. Between... Not at all. No, no, no. C naught is a is a is a gate. It is not a measurement. Until you measure either Alice's qubit or Bob's qubit, you cannot remove the entanglement between those two qubits. Okay. So the... All right. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So what happened now is because now C became one one zero. At that point, mm -hmm. if I make a measurement, mm -hmm. uh, Alice would be one and Bob would have zero. That okay. Time. So so let's not let's not make any measurements at that point. Okay. <laughs> because because I'm already well over time. So let me just try to finish this really quickly and then we can keep talking about it afterwards. Okay. Is that is that okay? I'm not trying to yes, dismiss your question. Uh, but but we'll we'll come back to this uh, in a little bit, okay? So now psi two. What is psi two? Psi two is what happens when you apply the Hardamard gate on the first qubit, okay? 
So when you apply the Hardamard gate to the first qubit, when you apply the Hardamard gate to the first qubit, this is the unknown qubit. Uh, so let me let me write down this the state chi is alpha zero plus beta one. When you apply the Hardamard gate, zero goes into the superposition of zero and one, and one goes into the other superposition of zero and minus one. Okay. So the result of this Hardamard gate on this qubit is is given by this by this expression. Okay. So what will happen is that when you apply this Hardamard gate to this qubit, which I'll, oops, which is in red here. So I apply Hardamard to this to this state. Okay, what is this replaced by? This is replaced by zero plus one by root two. And what happens to this one? This guy is replaced by zero minus one by root two. Okay, so the same thing for the other remaining qubits also. For this fellow, and for this fellow. All right, so how would you write down the effect on the quantum state? So for instance, if you take again, if you write here A, B, C, and D, what would be the effect? A would go from being in zero, 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 to being in this state, which is zero, 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 plus one, zero, zero, by root two. Similarly, B would go from zero being in the zero, one, one state. So I hope that at this point, uh, you are able to follow this and maybe for some of you, I might be going too slowly, right? So you have to make a substitution like this. You have to substitute, you have to substitute this state in the place of the A state here, right? And substitute this guy for the B state and so on. And so I won't write down what C and D are going to be. I leave that for you to work out the details. And the result, I'm just going to write down the result, okay? Psi two is going to be one by two. We'll get another factor of one by root two. Okay, then alpha zero, 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 plus alpha one, zero, zero, plus then we get beta zero one zero minus beta zero zero one then minus uh, beta one one zero uh, of course if you if you read about this algorithm in let's say uh nielsen and chuang which what which is what i'm using as my reference uh, they don't uh, use this they write things in a more compact way. All right. Now, this is our state psi two. Okay. And now what we are going to do is we are going to uh, cluster the first two qubits, the unknown qubit and 
uh, Alice is half. Okay, so we are going to take these two. and take those as our common and factor those out, okay? So zero, zero, if you look at, look at this, at the terms, you see that this component and this component, they both have zero, zero in the first two qubits. So we can write these two terms as zero, zero, tensor alpha zero plus beta one, okay? So what I have done is I've taken this state and this state, and then just rewritten them over here. Okay, I hope that again, this is not confusing. The same way I'll take, uh, so let me just, just mark, mark them like this with different colors. Okay. The same way I'll take the, this another pair and I'll write it as one, one zero tensor alpha zero minus beta one. And then we have one more, one more pair, but that pair is not doing anything. Uh, so actually I'll just go ahead and just copy down the answer from Nielsen, okay. So you have to add and subtract some terms. And so the final answer looks like this, zero, zero, alpha zero plus beta Okay, now you will notice one thing in this, in rewriting this expression. Do you notice something? Do you notice anything interesting in the way this expression is, is written down? There is chi somewhere, somewhere inside. Exactly, exactly. This is the state chi, right? And all of the others are also similar to the state chi. They are, right? So what is this? This is X acting on chi. My X and my chi look similar, but they are not. What is this? This is Z acting on chi. And what is the third one? The third one is X. So first you act uh, with, with, I don't think it, does it matter? Well, yeah, it matters. So uh, we act with Z and then we act. So like it's face and the second. bit flip, right? Like both. Right. So Z and X acting on. So you see all four of these components contain information about our unknown state and that information has been transferred to, to Bob's qubit. All right, now Alice has made a measurement, right? So now if Alice measures at this, at this stage, Alice makes a measurement. Okay. So if Alice gets zero, zero, what does this imply for Bob? It implies that Bob has the state chi, right? If Alice measures zero, one, it implies that Bob is in possession of the state X multiplied by chi. I can write this as Z zero X one chi one zero 
is Bob is in possession of the state Z chi. I can write this as Z1 X0 chi. And 1 1 implies that Bob is in possession of Z and X chi, which is Z1 X1 chi. Right? So what does Bob need to do to, to obtain the original state in all of those cases? Bob needs to take the result, the classical information that is given by Alice in the form of these two numbers, M1 and M2. And Bob needs to apply the following gates, right? So if M1, if M2 is one, then Bob applies the X gate. If M1 is one, then Bob applies the Z gate. And what is the result? The result is that after doing this, Bob ends up, Bob's qubit ends up precisely in the unknown state chi. Right? Because each one of those operations will, will be an inverse of this. Uh, so if you want, so what do you do if you want to get, if you want to get chi, let's look at the first case. The first case, we have this state. If you want to get chi from this, what do you do? You apply another x to it. So you get x squared chi, which is chi. Why? Because x squared is equal to one. Similarly, if you have z chi, what do you do? You apply Z to it. So you get Z chi, which is Z square chi, which is chi. Because Z square is equal to one. X square, Y square, and Z square, they're all equal to one. And then if you have ZX chi, what do you do now? What do you apply to this state? You apply ZX to this state? XZ. You apply XZ. Why is that? Because X and Z, they don't commute, remember. And this gives you chi. Right? Yes, sir. I might have gotten a couple of order of some components, some operations mixed up, but overall, I think I'm, I'm fine. Okay, and so this is the story of quantum teleportation has been achieved. All right. So I'll stop here for the day. I think today's class has gone on long enough. All right. But this is the first non trivial quantum algorithm. Yes. And we see many more in days to come. What I will be doing in the, in the upcoming classes, starting with. I will start to show you how to do it in my case. So, I, those of you who have downloaded, go ahead and install first. I will share some instruction with you on how to do that. Uh, those of you who don't have your own computer and use them in the labs, The best you option is to work with something screen. called Google Colab. Yeah, now I'm back. And uh, I'll again send you some instructions on how to work with Google Colab. Okay. And now, are there are there any questions?
sir, sir, without the classical information, this is, it, it won't work, right? No. So how does quantum teleportation help you? How does quantum teleportation work? Sir, without the classical information about uh, the unknown and Alice thing, uh, how does Bob even take, without classical information, he can't figure mm. out anything, right, Bob? So how right. does teleportation help you? Like, why are we calling it teleportation? Is that is that your question? Oh, yes, sir. Like, oh, what is it, sir? Benefit. Huh? Like, how is it useful? Well, it's useful because it, it is allowing us to take uh, one quantum state and transfer it to another person. Yes, sir, but... Without making a copy. Sir, but... Uh... So the point is that, look, 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 look. Okay, imagine that you want to construct a quantum network. So what, what should a quantum network be able to do? It should be able to take quantum states and you should be able to transport them through the network, right? Now, presumably, the network will be broken up into pieces, right? So you will have a path connecting any two points. So you want to be able to take a quantum state which starts at one end of a path, transport it to the first segment, the second segment, and so on till you get to the end of the path, right? And how do you do that? You do that as follows. You share EPR pairs, so each path, okay? So if two, so two routers, two quantum routers on each of the nodes are connected to each other, then what happens that there is a machine which is producing EPR pairs and sharing it with these routers. Okay, so if two routers are connected, they both hold a copy, one half of an EPR pair. And so if this router is connected to one, two, three, four routers, it holds four EPR pairs, one for this guy, one for this guy, one for this guy, one for this guy. Now the quantum state, let's say comes from here. What does, what is the process? At this node, at the initial node, an interaction, this C naught and Hadamard is performed on the EPR node pair present here and the unknown quantum state, right? The result is two classical bits which are transmitted down the wire to the first node, the first router. The first router has an EPR pair, right, for the starting node, uses that EPR pair, right, and performs these operations, right, the Z and X gate operations, but without making a measurement. After this step, what is this node left with the entanglement between this node and the original starting node is lost but now this node is in the possession of a state which was in originally here but now it's here do you understand yes, sir. Yeah. now what 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 does this node do this node has another epr pair associated with the next node in the path Again, the process is performed, the state is transported to the second node, third node, fourth node, so on. Yes, sir. Right. So quantum teleportation is going to be the building block of any quantum network. So any information encoded on Chi, like in the example, any information encoded on Chi will be transferred on to Bob as well, right? After he decode, uh, decrypts the chi quant, uh, qubit. So, so we are not saying that Bob is measuring chi, right? All we are saying is that Bob is in possession of the state chi. If so, Bob so wants, be, Bob can choose. To... So, so will he be Bob, able to Bob, access that encoded information? Yeah, sure, sure. Bob can make measurement on chi and. Uh, get some result. 
लाइक कि इनिशियली एलिस इनकोडेड सम इंफॉर्मेशन ऑन काई राइट एंड विच सी वॉन्ट्स टू सेंड टू बॉब सो वेन बॉब हैज डन ऑल दी प्रोसीजर एंड ही इज इन पोजिशन ऑफ पोजिशन ऑफ काई so will he mm-hmm. able to decode the uh, information well let's uh, not really worry too much about whether alice is able to encode information because information cannot really be encoded into a single qubit information is encoded into correlations between different sets of qubits and we haven't really talked about that at the, at this point let's just stick with the, what the statement is that we are working with a single quantum state and we are transferring that now you can build upon this structure right to transfer more than one state at the same time okay so you you could you could build a quantum teleportation circuit which transmits a more complicated state right so instead of remember chi is an arbitrary state chi is an arbitrary state right so here we are we are saying that it's a single qubit but one could also generalize this quantum teleportation circuit so that chi is a state of n qubits now it's a complex state and then alice could encode some information in that complex state and if bob knows the the encoding procedure then bob can decode that information okay yes sir all right so i'll stop it here for now i think we've gone on much too long but that's because this uh, this algorithm you know is uh, the first non trivial algorithm we look, looked at and uh, as we process into progress into the course i won't be taking baby steps like like you know i've been doing like i won't write down every single component step by step right so i hope that you will be able to get used to this the whole point of taking so long is to make sure that you are can follow along all right okay i'll stop the recording then